been a beautiful time. It has been a wonderful time. And those who joined us from the first ministration have that testimony assuredly. This moment, we are going to take a very, very crucial message. A message that everybody needs. A message that is appropriate for the now. Our GS informed us that it is just less than one minute to the midnight. And those of you that are students know that in the examination hall, when the supervisor says one more minute, everybody begins to cross the T's and dot the I's to ensure that nothing is left unattended. So we are going to draw our inspiration from the song book, song number 30, which says he died of a broken heart. While that song is being sung, let's sing with understanding. It's a message of its own. Let us hear from, let's get our leading from the music ministers.
right there where you are, you open your mouth and tell the Almighty God that you thank him for Jesus whom he sent to die for you. And then you pledge that that death will not be in vain for you. You tell the Lord, Lord, let not that death be in vain for me. Let it not be my undoing. Let the purpose of that death, O oh God, work out, be worked out in my life. Tell the Lord, I have decided to yield to Jesus, to please him who died for me. And then go ahead and tell him to speak his word to you, that the word of God may reach you today, that the word will not pass you by, that it will not remain the same after this message. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Eternal Father, we thank you so much for this moment and that time of dispensing the law of liberty. Bless your holy name, King of heaven, who granted joy mercies to your people from the places of abode to this place of concourse. Thank you for all the people connected in different parts of the world. People who belong to the ministry and the friends of the ministry who know that the hand of God is upon this great movement. Thank you for the people who also, Lord in heaven, are in their various places of work who are able to tune in. And right now, they are there with us, connected together. Lord in heaven, we thank you for what you have in stock for us during this Easter program. Father, I ask and pray that as I dispense this truth, that it will be beneficial to all. It will not be an instrument of condemnation, but rather an instrument of recovery. That nobody, after listening to this message, can remain unsaved. I therefore implore that the spirit of truth will have his way. That as this word goes forth, revelations will flow from the truth of God's word. And people who didn't have understanding in time past will have understanding. Understanding of the truth. For the truth brings freedom. When one understands the truth, freedom comes naturally. Let nobody remain under the bondage of sin after this ministration. No matter who or where. In the name of Jesus Christ. Remember that your word is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Remember, you have not called the seed of Jacob to seek you in vain. Therefore, all these precious people will not tune to this ministration in vain. Lord in heaven, let your words search out the hearts. Search out areas that have been covered, that over time, dust has covered. Great Father, open them up so that there can be purification by the agency of the world. That nobody after this ministration will not remain, will not be a candidate of heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you once again for answering our prayers. Now speak for your children are listening. And let your name be glorified ultimately. In Jesus name. And amen. Right here where you are, please you may be seated. Our Easter program is titled... There is listing and labor for all. And uh, we have had administrations already preparing us and informing us of the basis for the listing or basis for the enlistment or enrollment into the service of God. Today, at this moment, I'm getting into the requirement for the enrollment. The requirement for the listing. We have already told you the basis for the listing, which is all about the work that Jesus came and did on this earth, the purpose of his first advent. Now, let's see the requirement for that enrollment, what is essential, what is required of you to possess before you can be given that privilege of service. We all know, or we should know, that the gifts of God are so expensive that no man can buy them. So God makes them so cheap and affordable that no person cannot get them. That it is come from the scriptures. 
in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6, he says, don't give your precious thing to dogs and to pigs. Those things that are precious, the treasures that you value. Don't give it to dogs. Don't give to pigs because they don't know the value and they will simply trample upon them. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 6. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pills before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. The holy thing you don't give to the dog. Valuable, holy, don't give to dog. Dog does not know the value. Priceless, precious on and on, um, things, don't give to pigs because they don't know the value. It is metaphorical of valuable things not being given to people that don't have knowledge of the value. So when God gives you something precious, he expects you to keep it precious. In Matthew chapter number 22, verses 11 through 14, that was he expressed there in the parable of the royal wedding, royal marriage feast. Matthew chapter 22, from verse number 11. And when the king came to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Find him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. That the parable of the wedding feast of the king's son. The people that were invited for the wedding, for the feast, gave reasons why they won't come. So the king wouldn't want the things prepared to be wasted. He now opened the door to people who were not qualified to come, to feast in the king's uh, palace. And so everybody came. And there was a young man who didn't value that privilege because it was a tradition that there are coats you normally wear when going for a wedding occasion. That young man didn't wear the coat. Other people wore the coat. They appreciated it and they wore the coat and were prepared. But the young man came unprepared and the king sent him out and didn't only send him out and requested that or recommended that he should be tortured, tormented. That is how God, this is a parable teaching you how God takes his things. Things that you don't merit. When he gives them to you and you don't, you don't behave as if they are of what? You despise them. Then he will show you that you didn't marry them. So we are saying that that is God's nature. Therefore, anything that God gives us which we did not merit, he will want us to show that that thing is valuable. Similarly, although no mortal is qualified to enjoy the privilege of laboring with God, laboring in God's vineyard, no mortal is worthy of enjoying that privilege of being a co-laborer with God. Yet, God has made it possible that mortals become co-laborers with him. And anybody that gets that privilege and despises it, he will not take it lightly with the person. Let's see what Eliphaz said about human beings and then what God also said about himself. In Job chapter 15, mortal men are not qualified to enjoy the service in God's vineyard, enjoy the privilege of serving God. It should have been angels in heaven made to be servants of God. Angels of high quality. So when God gives a mortal man the privilege, that mortal man is expected to highly value it. In Job chapter 15, verses 14 through 16. Job 15 from verse 14. 
What is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Behold, he put that no trust in his sins. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. Here man is shown not to be clean. And God is shown to be so clean and so holy that even the heavens don't look clean enough. So man that drinks iniquity like water, does he have any place to tell God, God, I want to walk with you. That God that is so holy that heavens don't look clean enough. Man in his wretchedness that drinks iniquity like water is not qualified in any way to walk I don't care with that holy God. Now, in Isaiah chapter number 55, verses 8 and 9, Isaiah, God now speaks about himself. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I am, I am superlatively superior to you. No comparison. So you don't have any privilege. You don't have, there is no comparison that will make two of us to begin to walk together. So if God gives you the privilege of walking with him, it is a great privilege that should be highly appreciated. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul now showed that people who are in the church, who are serving God, are co-laborers with him. God has given them that privilege to enjoy working with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's beauty. We, the workers, are laborers together with God. We are co-laborers with God. God is the owner of the business. We are employed. But we work together with him. We are co-laborers with him. So, there is listing for all. There is work for all. There is labor for all. A Roman for people to walk with God is available. Vacancies are everywhere to walk with God. But it is not for any harm person. It is only for people who have the required qualification. There are prerequisites. Basic uh, conditions to be fulfilled. Basic. They don't make you fully qualified. They qualifications don't make it a right for you to have the job. It's still a privilege but those basic qualifications must be met and those are the qualifications we want to look into right away. We are going to take the first qualification called salvation experience to get enrolled to get enlisted in the vineyard of God to become a co-laborer with God as God is, is requesting, you must have salvation experience. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, reading verses 1 through 9. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. Luke 19. Verses 1 to 9. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a thick tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. 
And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. Come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Here was a man seen by the society as a terrible sinner because of his profession. He was a tax collector. And tax collectors then were habitual extortioners, merciless extortioners. And so they were derided by the religious society. But this man, though an extortioner, has some consciousness for God, some quest for God within him. On hearing that Jesus, that holy man, that righteous man, that holder of the truth, who did not fear any man, who spoke the truth, on hearing that he was coming that way, he had a disadvantage of height. He wouldn't allow that disadvantage to prevent him from beholding this holy man. He didn't allow his, the glory of his wealth to make him ashamed of utilizing a tree that will assist him or enable him to see the man. This rich, short man climbed a sycamore tree to behold Jesus. And as soon as Jesus reached that place, one way or the other, full of the Spirit of God, Jesus called him by name and assessed him by the knowledge of the Spirit of God in Jesus, he knew that this man was arrived for salvation. And he said, come down. I'm coming to visit you today. That word of Jesus brought conviction and transformation to the man. And immediately, the Spirit of God in Jesus, working in the man, made that man to say, anything I have extorted from people, I will make my restitution. As soon as he spoke of restitution, Jesus announced that salvation had come. It wasn't a preacher that told him that you have to make restitution when you are saved. It is that when somebody is saved, his conscience will make him know that you need to make right the wrongs you have done. So as soon as he announced restitution, Jesus announced salvation has come. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 8, Acts chapter 8, verses 27 through 39. Acts chapter number 8, verses 27 through 39. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. From verse number 27. And he arose and went and behold a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself. To this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of which the scripture, the place of the scripture which he read was this He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him 
Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came onto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, there is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Something had happened to him. Something had happened to him. Because if a man is put into ordinary water and you bring him out, he won't be going rejoicing. Something has happened to him. A transformation that yielded, that expressed joy in his heart had taken place. And so he went with salvation. That joy was the manifestation of the salvation that has taken place. Here was a wealthy man, a powerful man, a man in charge of the treasury of a nation, a, a rich nation, who has some fear of God and will travel from his place, Ethiopia, down to Jerusalem through the rugged way upon the a beast of burden. Then the Lord spoke to Philip, and through Philip, salvation came his way. And the man said, what hinders me? What will prevent me from getting baptized? Because in the course of the ministration, Philip what has spoken about the baptism. And Philip turned and said, if you believe, and he said, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. And he did the, the, executed this, uh, the baptism, and next moment, that joy filled his heart. Something had taken place. It wasn't the baptism in water that caused the joy. It was what had happened within, which the baptism in water was just expressing. So we're talking about salvation experience. What is experience, by the way? That word experience in our own context is something personally encountered. Something personally encountered. Something that somebody encounters as a person. Or you can also describe it as practical knowledge derived from participation in an event. Practical knowledge derived from participation in an event. You participate in an event and then you have knowledge based on your participation, practical knowledge. So that is what experience is. So salvation is an experience, is knowledge of salvation, what it is, based on testing it, having tested it. You have tested salvation and then you have knowledge of what it is. Salvation experience. Salvation is a phenomenon that takes place in the life of somebody. When you have experienced that phenomenon, then you can say, I have salvation experience. And this is a basic, a fundamental prerequisite for service in the house of God and for getting enlisted in this last move of the Holy Ghost. It is essential that those that must be enrolled into this last lap of the race, serving God as God's collaborators, it is expedient that they must have experience of the phenomenon called salvation. What then is salvation? Salvation in the general text is all about deliverance, preservation, and liberation. The Greek word soteria, S-O-T-E-R-I-A, was translated salvation, and it covers things in the physical, things in the spiritual realms. 
holy things in the material world as it pertains to preservation. Good health, enjoy good health, deliverance from problems and pains, all of them are under salvation. But salvation experience, which we are talking about, is not talking about all those physical deliverances and liberations. It has to do with spiritual deliverance granted immediately by God to those who accept his conditions of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That spiritual experience, spiritual deliverance that God grants immediately. It is not a thing that takes a lot of time over years. It takes, no, it is granted immediately. It is an instantaneous experience. It is an instantaneous experience that somebody fulfills the conditionalities for it. God grants it to you instantaneously. What are the prerequisites for it? What are the conditionalities that one accepts? One is repentance. Two is faith in the Lord Jesus. Repentance from dead works and faith in the Lord Jesus. Repentance from sin. Dead works all have to do with iniquity sin. Those works that are lifeless. Those works that rather destroy life. Repentance, being sorrowful, very sorry about them, and then having trust in the finished work of Calvary. When those two conditions are fulfilled, God releases that phenomenon called salvation in the person's life. And when it takes place, the person will have the experience. The eunuch had the experience as that phenomenon occurred in his life. He ended up rejoicing. There was joy as he went home because some things had happened. In Proverbs chapter 28, Proverbs chapter 28, a principle of forgiveness must be kept. Repent and then forgiveness will follow. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In Psalm number 51. Psalm 51. Verse number 3. There was a man. A man that will not, no longer cover the sins, who voiced it out. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I acknowledge my transgression. I accept that I have transgressed. I don't have any excuse. I don't have any reason to give why I did that which was offensive to God. I am sorry about it. I acknowledge and then I'm sorry. I regret having done it. Forgive me. Anybody that does that from the depth of the heart, God will forgive. And as he forgives, he expects that person to anchor on what Jesus accomplished at the cross of Calvary. In Romans chapter 10, Verse number 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse number 10. We sang, he died of a broken heart. You must trust that work that Jesus accomplished at Calvary. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, after you have repented of that evil work, in your heart, you believe that God has forgiven you. Then with your mouth, you confess. You confess Jesus and confess what he has done for you. You confess that you have received him. And you confess that you believe that you have been forgiven. You confess unto salvation. 
as you begin to confess, that salvation experience will be ignited. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, the foundation of our faith. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Here, Paul, believed to be the writer of this epistle, said to these brethren, it is time to move on to maturity. Move on to being mature. It's time to leave the elementary things because salvation is elementary. Move away from messages of salvation and move on to messages of maturity or maturation. Messages that mature. So, salvation, repentance from dead works, and faith towards God, which is salvation, they are elementary. That's why we are saying these are elementary, essential. They are the eyes, dotting of the eyes, and the crossing of the T's that the students must do to be sure and doubly sure. Because without these elementary experiences, you will never see God without the salvation. This is the passport. Passport to God. The man of God, our GS, said to us, July 2019, during the lip declaration, that the time has come when the hitherto bypassed, neglected, and forgotten cardinal experiences of genuine regeneration, things that have been bypassed, forgotten, neglected, like genuine regeneration, the passport that links one to God. That the time has come when we will come back to them and put them again on the front burner once again. Because there is a tendency for people to neglect it after they have experienced it, neglect it and lose it. Every experience that every experience you get in the kingdom can be lost. Every experience you get can be lost. And this is an experience. And people can experience it today and lose it the next day, depending on how they handle it. So we want to look at the experience properly today so that if somebody has lost it, the person can recover or regain it. And if somebody had never had this, that person can acquire it on your own. You are incapacitated and you can't get it on your own. So God makes it easy, cheap, affordable and available that you may get it. So pay attention as we continue so that if you are lacking it, if you find yourself wanting, you may get it today. In Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. Now, an epistle to the Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here, the apostle showed that it is the gospel that is the power of God that genders, that bets, that generates salvation. It is the gospel, the good news. The good news is all about the work that Jesus accomplished for us. That's the good news. Freedom from sin based on his death. That's the good news. That you can now be free to, en to enjoy the life of God while on earth. Enjoy eternal life based on what Jesus did on your behalf. That's the good news. And it is the power of God that brings salvation. When the phenomenon of salvation has taken place in your life, you have the experience. It goes with experience. It is a phenomenon. When it takes place, 
there will be knowledge that it has taken place. That knowledge is the expression of the experience. This phenomenon was called regeneration and also was called born again experience. In Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, reading verse 5, Titus chapter number 3, verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Here he makes mention of washing of regeneration. Regeneration that washes you. When this experience has come, the person is cleansed of sin that has polluted him. It is regeneration. It is also called justification. When that experience or when that phenomenon has taken place in your life, you become justified. The evils you have done, the sins you have committed that warranted judgment will now be taken away. You will be justified for those things. They will no longer stand against you. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Jesus was delivered, was killed because of our sins and then raised again from the dead so that we can be justified. So if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there would have been no place for justification of the sinner. So his death and resurrection gendered justification, which we also call salvation or born again experience. In John's Gospel chapter 3, born again experience, verses 1 through 8. John's Gospel chapter 3, from verse number 1 through verse number 8. Gospel of St. John, chapter number 3, from verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God deal with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell when it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Born again or born of the spirit. When that phenomenon has taken place in your life, you will be counted as somebody born of the spirit. You were born the first time from your mother's womb, born into this world. When that phenomenon takes place, you are born into the spirit world where God has his way. You are born into the kingdom of God. The first birth is into this physical world. The second birth, where it was said born again, a second time, is you are born into God's kingdom. Nobody was born naturally into God's kingdom. Everybody was born a sinner. And a sinner belongs to Satan. The day that sinner gets this phenomenon and experiences this phenomenon, that sinner is now born a second time into this time into the kingdom of God. He is said to be born of the spirit because it is an action carried out by the spirit of God. So it is, he is born of the spirit and he is born again because he was born the first time naturally. He was born the second time by the spirit of God. The person becomes a citizen of God's kingdom. The person becomes a citizen of heaven. 
and becomes a joint heir with Christ. It is a great experience. Great experience. So, when the phenomenon takes place, the individual is counted born again. He has become born, translated into the kingdom of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verses 22 and 23. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Being born again. Based on the fact that you are born again, these manifestations of verse 22 should be there. That's what that scripture is saying. What are the manifestations? Love of brethren through the spirit. Love one another with a pure heart. Because you are born again, loving one another with a pure heart is now possible. Loving the brethren, carrying a pure spirit is not possible. But in that verse 23, he now said that that experience or that phenomenon of born again didn't come as a result of a carnal encounter. It is not the water that you entered into, the physical water, because physical water is corruptible. You are born again, not of corruptible seed. So it is not the physical water that somebody is baptized with that genders the experience. That physical water is just symbolic. It is rather spiritual water. Water of the word of God. The word of God is water. Cleanses. It is that water of the word that genders by the spirit of God brings about the transformation called born again. The person is translated into God's own kingdom from the kingdom of darkness that he was born into. The water of God's word. So, the person gets into the kingdom of God. When that experience has come, when that phenomenon has taken place, the individual is required to now this a new net of life. Capacity to live a new life has been received through that phenomenon. You are now expected to utilize that capacity and display a new life. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, from verse number 4 through verse number 14. The Spirit of God working with the Word of God generates a, an experience called salvation. And that individual that has that experience, that uh, phenomenon, is now required to utilize what has been invested in him through the experience to lead a new life. In Romans chapter number 6, from verse number 4 through Verse number 14. Romans 6, verses 4 through 14. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. 
Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law but under grace in those days the doctrine of baptism was always flaunted it was always spoken of anytime they are preaching they must talk about baptism in those days because that time christianity was something abhorring to be associated with a man that was crucified, which in Judaism was a curse. Cursed is he that hangeth on the tree. So for you to say, I am a follower of that man that was crucified, that was hanged on the tree, it was debasing. So that doctrine of baptism was always presented. Once you identify with this man, then we will initiate you baptism was a form of initiation initiate you into the body of christ an outward expression of what had taken place it didn't begin with christianity remember that john didn't practice christianity but he was baptizing among the jews baptism was there so in christianity anybody that identifies with this man that is cursed our Lord Jesus, hanging on the tree. Immediately, the person was initiated to give him a kind of boldness that he now belongs. It didn't mean that it was that water the person was put into that cleansed him or her. It was the word preached. It is the word preached that did the cleansing. Then that water was symbolic. As you put the person into the water, it symbolizes or it is representing you having been buried together with Jesus into the ground. And then as the person is raised, lifted up from the water, it signified or symbolized you rising from the dead with Jesus Christ. That was what it was all about. So it wasn't the water that was purifying, the physical water. Because physical water is corruptible. Those that read chemistry or who have read chemistry know that every agent or element has a half-life. Every element you can see or you can feel has a half-life. When that half-life expires, that agent is cut by two. What has half-life? So anything that has a half-life is corruptible. It will depreciate with time. What genders new birth is not corruptible. It cannot depreciate with time. That is God's word and God's spirit. So salvation experience comes through the operation of God's word which is the gospel and the spirit of God back in the world when that experience has taken place you have received the capacity to say no to temptation the experience does not prevent temptations from calling as far as you are carrying a human body temptations must keep on calling but you have received power to say no. Prior to the experience, you couldn't really say no. After saying no, the next moment you trip. But when this phenomenon called salvation has taken place, this activity of God's word and spirit in the spirit man called regeneration, where it has taken place, you can then say no to sin. So verse 14, we read, says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Before the Phenomenon, sin rules you. You may not want to commit the sin, but you see yourself committing it. And every time you are unhappy about the sins you are committing, 
Yet you are eating the sin, drinking the sin. When this experience, when this phenomenon called salvation has taken place, those sins will no longer be your master. And that is a, the acid test of salvation. Anybody that is still being mastered by sin has not received the experience. The phenomenon has not taken place. When salvation takes place, sin shall not have dominion over you. After the experience, when the salvation has taken place, you are required to live in a consciousness. He says, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Begin to see yourself as having died to sin. When somebody is dead, that person does not react to natural stimuli. A dead man, if you bring fire and put on the body, he doesn't move around. You take a sharp object and prick him or her, no response. Now, you are said here that you should count yourself to have died. That when Jesus died, that was when you died to sin. You live in that consciousness that you have died to sin. You create the awareness in yourself that I have died to sin. I don't respond again to sin. So no matter how sin is beckoning, you will refuse to respond. The word reckon means estimate. Estimate yourself to have died. Impute yourself. Count yourself. Account yourself to have died to sin. Begin to see yourself as one that has died to sin. Once this phenomenon has taken place, begin to, because that is what will give you the victory. Sin will still call. Temptation will still call. But that state of mind you have won, that new state of mind, is what will make you say no to that call of sin. And God's word says that he will not allow any temptation you can bear to come your way. So any temptation that comes, you say no. I have died to you. And he said, as a result of this reckoning, verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. When sin calls, temptation has called. If you didn't carry this mind that you have died to it, you may yield. When the pressure comes, you yield. But when you count yourself as having died to it, that sin, that temptation will find its way out. So let your body yield unto righteousness and not unto unrighteousness. If anybody is yielding to sin, then that person, if he wants God born again, that person will get lost again. You are a free moral agent. You have capacity to say no or yes, to make a choice. When God has given you ability to choose the right, and you refuse to choose the right, and you choose the wrong, and if you continue in choosing the wrong, that wonderful, priceless phenomenon that was, that was carried out in your body, that experience that came, will get lost. It will vanish from your life. And that may be the problem of some people today. Now that we hear of a lot of problems in church, problems in business between brethren, problems of people being unfaithful, married people unfaithful, single people soiling themselves, messing themselves up because of one or the other, a lot of telling of lies. All these are suggesting that those who were once born again have lost the experience. And others who think they are born again we are never born again. Because God's word must stand true and every other thing a liar. Here again in verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. When that phenomenon called salvation has taken place, the grace of God will come upon you to energize you, to enable you to do what God requires of you.
to enable you to say no when temptations come. John chapter 1 and verse 12. John's gospel chapter 1. Verse number 12. Anybody living in sin has either never been born again or is a backslider. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. To them gave he the ability to become the sons of God. Sons of God don't live in sin. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. These are scriptures now assessing you. Wanting you to assess yourself in your sincerity. Such that if an altar call is given, if you found yourself wanting, no matter how long you have stayed in church, you humble yourself. Don't cover your sin. You come to the front of the altar and cry to God to have mercy on you. That is what God is looking for. Don't allow pride to make you not to answer the altar call. In 1 John chapter 3, verse number 6 through verse number 9. 1 John chapter 3 from verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth had not seen him, neither known him. Let me talk on that first. Whosoever continues in sin has not seen him, neither known him. He that abides in him does not continue in sin. Whosoever continues in sin has not seen Christ, neither known Christ. Verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 we read, said God will put his spirit in the person. That seed of God makes the person to say no to sin. Here we are now told that that is how to know a child of God. Whosoever is born of God, whosoever is born of the spirit, that word that Jesus said to Nicodemus, except you are born of the water and of the spirit, water of the word of God and the spirit of God working together, you accept that encounter takes place, you will remain a natural man. You may be religious, but you will not be free from sin. Whosoever has that encounter with God's word and spirit, that person is a child of God, he is born of the spirit, he is born of God, he is born again, he is regenerated, he is justified. He cannot continue in sin because something has happened in him. That makes him reject sin. So if you commit sin habitually, in the business you commit sin habitually, you tell lies habitually, you tell lies over the thing you are selling, you say it habitually, you tell lies in the family, you tell lies to your colleagues, you tell little, they call lie little, you do it, you, if you are born again, you have lost it, you, have, you are lost again. You may be an elder in the church. You may be a worker in the church. You may even be a pastor. You may even be a pastor. It been a senior pastor. But you can freely tell lies. You have lost it. Anybody that retains that seed cannot continue in sin. Because that seed will make that person not to continue in sin. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. If you keep on walking and you didn't take note of what God is showing you that your name is no longer in the book of life. When you finish walking, 
and you want to enter heaven, you will belong to the group. Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. Depart. When you are doing the work, your name was in my book. In the book of members of my kingdom. Because you continue to commit sin and commit sin till it was erased. Your name was written the day you gave your life to Jesus as a citizen of heaven. Written in the golden book of God. And then you return to, to sin. To be a producer of iniquity. Sin is a work. Dead work. When you commit sin, you have produced something offensive. Spiritually, sin is concrete. So any sin you commit, you have manufactured spiritually a concrete nauseating substance. And that is what you are manufacturing. And you are doing God's work at the same time. Jesus says, he will say, get out from my sight. I never knew you. When you are doing those sins, I didn't know you. You didn't belong to me. So the minister, the whole primitive leader, the person that is leading others in evangelism or whatever, who is a habitual sinner, who, con con who is comfortable with telling lies, comfortable with fighting, comfortable with insulting, comfortable with doing anything that God does not approve of, that person has got lost without knowing. And this meeting is a meeting that God is giving you opportunity to get recovered. That you may not regret in eternity. Whosoever continues in sin is of the devil. Then in verse 10 of that first John chapter 3, he says clearly that that is how you differentiate between people or children of God and the children of the devil. In verse 10 of that first John chapter 3, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. This is how you see who is who. You know who is who. God's children and devil's children. God's children don't make practice of sin. They don't continue in sin. Anybody that continues in sin belongs to the other kingdom. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So beloved brother, beloved sister, beloved elder, because many times we, we made the preparation telling you that the things of God are very expensive. So expensive that nobody can acquire them on his or her own ability. So God makes it so cheap that nobody can say I couldn't get it. It was out of my reach. Now if you Get it from the Lord and you despise it. The Lord will show you that that thing is of high value. Those that have despised it, if they don't recover and come back to God with brokenness, if they allow pride, if they allow pride to keep them in that situation, then hear what Apostle Paul, believed to be the writer of the Hebrews, said in the book of Hebrews, letter to the Hebrews, Chapter number 2. Hebrew chapter 2. From verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which are the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that had him. If the things that Moses wrote given by angels, if they were kept to the letter of the judgment, who then can escape this great privilege brought by Jesus if you neglect it? So precious man, precious woman, brother, sister, there is need to look in. God's word has tested you. Do you make practice of sin? Do you live in sin? You say, no, by God's grace, I don't live in sin. That unforgiveness that you retain in your heart, that implacable heart, 
a heart that doesn't forgive people is that the heart you want to go to heaven with if you don't forgive people your own sins cannot be forgiven salvation has not yet come if you are living in unforgiveness because the wrongs you are doing have not been forgiven you the experience is a gift of God and can be lost it is a gift of God and it can be lost in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 when you get it you need to preserve it if you don't you will lose it on your own you cannot get it Ephesians chapter number 2 verse number 8 Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God a gift given to you you got saved you enjoyed salvation by the mercy of God so God gave it to you as a gift not because you did any work and because it's given to you as a gift you can throw a gift away if you neglect that gift it can drop from your hand when somebody has entered this enjoyed this experience that person will have the spirit of Christ in him called the seed of God so the person will have Jesus in him Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9 Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you now if any man have not the spirit of Christ he is none of his when this phenomenon called salvation has taken place there will be a deposit of God's spirit or spirit of Christ whichever title you use in you by that Jesus begins to dwell in you you are part and parcel of Jesus family if you don't have that spirit of Christ you don't belong to him in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 5 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 5 now he that had wrought us for the self same thing is God who also has given unto us the earnest of the spirit unto those who are born again there is a deposit of the spirit of God chapter 1 of the same second Corinthians verse number 22 who had also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts so that salvation phenomenon goes with depositing of God's spirit in an individual that God's spirit is also called the spirit of Christ that is what enables you energizes you to live for God to do what is required of you that is what manifests as grace in your life enabling you to do what God demands when it has come you are still a free moral agent you are expected to yield it to him to follow the laws of your new kingdom to follow the laws of the kingdom of Christ to depart from the laws of sin and death to the laws of the kingdom of light so you are to lead a new life second Corinthians chapter number five verse number 17 second Corinthians chapter five and verse 17 therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature all things are passed away behold all things are become new if any man be in Christ he is a new creature that was creature there means creation he is a new creation a new creation that's the real meaning he has moved she has moved from whom she was to a beautiful a wonderful being that has come up from a phenomenon called salvation all things all life the laws of sin and death that were holding him have given way he is now she is now empowered energized with the law of the spirit of Christ the law of life that enables him to do what is required 
in the kingdom. So that person should reckon himself as having died to that old life and now having embraced a new way so that when sin calls, he or she can say no. And if that person stands by this new mentality, this mentality of I am dead to sin, that person will be able to enjoy final salvation. Final salvation is that salvation, that deliverance, that liberation that will take place at the end of your earthly pilgrimage. That is final salvation. That is not salvation experience. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12. We are for my beloved, as he have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He was writing to people who already have this salvation that Jesus Christ worked out. Salvation based on Calvary, which you got into by repenting of your sin and then trusting, having faith in Jesus. That is the salvation that the people have called salvation experience. They were the ones being written to and they were taught to work out their own final salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling that it is possible if I am not careful, it is possible that I will be lost. And as a result of that, the person is careful watching with serious caution, watching with critical self-evaluation, serious caution, not doing anything anyhow, not taking anything for granted, not giving room to any little sin, because there is a possibility of losing out after you have got the first experience called salvation experience. If you didn't keep it, you can lose out. So work out your final salvation with fear and trembling, with fear and great caution. Great caution. Don't take anything for granted. This experience or this phenomenon makes you a citizen of heaven and then adopts you as a child of God into sonship. Romans chapter 8 verse 15. Romans chapter 8, verse number 15. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. The spirit itself, no, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So this salvation phenomenon is a process that makes a sinner to become a member of the family of God. You now become adopted. Initially, you are not of God's family. Then God now takes you as an adopted child of his. You can now say, Daddy. You can now call God Daddy. You are now free to call God Daddy. So, it is a wonderful thing that any sinner, every sinner, must seek to have. On your own, you are, cannot have it. But when you do all the requires of you, you will get it on a platter of gold. And the Lord requires that you keep it. The experience goes with freedom from the bondage of sin. And then peace will follow in the hearts. Thereafter, there must be a change of life, lifestyle. He we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, chapter 5, verse 17, a new creature. All things pass away by reckoning that you are saved, you are freed from sin, you are dead to sin. You now begin to live right, and those temptations will no longer bring you down again. Newness of life follows. You change your values, move away from the old values that we are linked to your former world to the new values that your new kingdom presents. You go to a new fellowship, moving from the fellowship of sinners you used to enjoy to now fellowship of sins. You change your friends, move from the friendship with the people of the world to friendship with people of the kingdom. You move to new desires and new ambition. 
Those are things now you are required to begin to do, to boost, to grow in the kingdom. Move away from the former desire, those things you are pursuing that are of temporal consequence. Move away from them. Those things that can destroy you if you continue them. Move away from them and move to what is required now in the new kingdom. What is required? The things of God to grow, to excel in the kingdom. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter number 3. From verse number 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. We are Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, in all dignity, excessive affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For we things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. You have put on the new man. Putting on the new man is a thing that happens instantaneously. At salvation, the new man is put on. You are now expected to live as one that has put on the new man. Then take away all those habits, all those things the old man was addicted to. Take away all those things that the old man was known for. You are now a new man. Follow the principles of the new kingdom. Follow the rules of the new kingdom. Follow the laws of the kingdom. Count yourself as having died to sin. So when sin calls, you don't attend to it. No matter the temptation, you will be able to say no because you have received the power to say no. Anybody that is still committing sin, that person, if he or she was born again, that person has become lost again. People that talk about the doctrine of eternal security, once you are born again, you are born again forever. That is a lie of the devil. It is a lie of the devil. It is only those that overcome that shall enter into the kingdom. Only those that overcome, those that retain their salvation, retain their experience, and lived in the possible fear of loss of that experience. And as a result, they were conscious of whatever they were doing and conscious of their lives, not losing what they have. Such are the ones that will be victorious. They are the ones that will be ultimately saved. If somebody got born again but did not preserve, he will lose it. And if one loses it, one has lost it. Judas was once born again. But he didn't keep his salvation. And Jesus kept on warning. And warned and warned. But he didn't hearken to Jesus' warning. And he perished after having been born again. Why? If he wasn't born again, Jesus would have commented the day they all came reporting of the wonderful thing that happened in Luke chapter 10. Jesus said they shouldn't rejoice just because the devils bowed to them. They should rather rejoice because their names were written in the book of life. He didn't say except one of you. All of them had their names written. They were all saved. But Judas got lost. A man, he was an apostle. He wasn't just a pastor. Judas wasn't just an evangelist. Judas wasn't just a prophet. He was an apostle, a God sent. But he, the tongues around his gold, he didn't take care of. Covetousness was a tongue around the golden apostolic office. Covetousness. He didn't take care of it. And that covetousness destroyed him. He tells us, 
that if an apostle can go to hell, you and I, who are not apostles, can equally. And even much more. How can I get saved? How can I get this experience? How can this phenomenon take place in my life? Somebody is asking, you are living in sin. You don't like the sin. But all this while, you have made resolutions, uncountable resolutions. Yet, this things crying, kept on crying. I will present very simple, the two steps, very simple. And right there where you are, as you just follow these two simple steps, and you pray, your life will be changed instantaneously. That is salvation. You will put on the new man instantaneously. The irreplaceable experience is acquired through number one, repentance from dead works. Being sorry for the sins you have been committing. A person that is repentant has a desire not to continue. Sees that the thing is bad, then desires that it won't be continued. It is not enough to say it is bad. But right there in the mind, there is a provision to continue. If you are living in fornication and you know it is bad, why will you continue with your same partner? Anybody that says fornication is not good, is not good, that person in their mind will say, I will cut off that ungodly relationship without my same partner. If anybody is enjoying that relationship, and then he said, I'm sorry, I don't like this sin. That person is not telling himself or herself the truth. So, the first thing is, repent of your dead works. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, which we earlier read, we read again, is the foundation of the faith. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the principle of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Being sorry for the sins you have been committing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm reading verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verses 9 and 10. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Paul had written a letter to the Corinthians and lash them. Seriously. Lash them with words. And on writing the second letter, he said, he acknowledged the sorrow that his first letter wrote, the cost. And then said, I didn't rejoice that you people are just sorrowful. But my joy was that, that your sorrow was a godly sorrow that led to repent, to salvation. So there is godly sorrow that yields salvation. We are somebody is saying, why did I do continue? Why have I continued to offend God? Why have I continued to do this? Why have I continued to neglect Christ? Jesus died for me. He died of a broken heart for me. And then I, instead of yielding to follow him, I am committing sin and doing those things offensive to him. Giving my body over to, to immorality. Telling lies, fighting, killing doing all manner of things that Jesus died for. And that person is sorry. And he's saying, Lord, I regret, I repent. That is godly sorrow. Let nobody make this truth to look weightless. Salvation doesn't come to people who didn't have repentance. 
It is not as a matter of repeating some prayers that somebody tells you to repeat and that tells you are born again. You must have a touch in your heart of penitence. That is what genders salvation. If there are no penitence and you recited one prayer, prayer of the Lord and prayer of a, a sinner, that is rubbish. It does not make any meaning. A computer can recite that prayer. Does that computer get saved? No. You can teach a parrot to recite that prayer. That parrot will not get saved. So recitation of prayer doesn't make meaning. There must be a genuine touch in the heart where the person is sorry for his or her sins. And then based on that, decides not to continue in it. Confesses the sin and believes that he has been forgiven based on what Jesus did. That is the second point. Faith in what Jesus has done at Calvary. Faith in what Jesus has accomplished at Calvary. Once that faith is there, salvation clicks. God's word that gendered that penitence and God's spirit that did that penitence will now deliver you into the kingdom of light. Translation takes place. You will have salvation experience. That translation, that change from the dimension of sin and the flesh to the dimension of light, law for God. It will manifest in your body, in your life. That what happened to the eunuch that after coming out from the water, he went home rejoicing. Something had taken place. When it happened to me, it was as if I couldn't talk again. A man that had lived in sin, struggled in sin, gone to the confessional, tried to keep the, do the Easter duty, do everything. Yet, sin held the man down. Then in the lecture theater, in the presence of colleagues that we party together, commit sin together, talk together with rubbish, that was where I gave my life to Christ. And my life changed. And since then till now, that grace has kept me in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, from verse number 11. Titus chapter number 2, from verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared unto all men, teaching us, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace available. Receive it. It enables you to live soberly, righteously, and godly, piously, in this world. In this world. It is available. The, the, the ideology of we are like fishes in the water. Just as the fish in the water cannot deny water, so are we in a world of sin and we can't deny sin. That is a devil's ideology. That is what the devil uses to keep his own. God's word says that the grace of God has appeared. Take it, receive it through the simple way of repenting of your sin. Repent. Be sorry. Jesus died for you. And the thank you you are giving to him back is committing sin and wounding him. Wounding his soul. Making him grieve that he died for you and you are paying him back with evil. Be sorry. He didn't do you any evil. He did you good. Be sorry. And then, confess. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Romans 10.10. Whoso with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. As you confess your sins and confess the lordship of Jesus, the spirit of God and the word of God will work salvation and the experience will follow. Then you have fulfilled one of the prerequisites for being a co-laborer with God. We are going to get to prayer right now. And wherever you are in the church, you will rise on your feet and 
talk to the Lord. Remember, pride can hinder you from getting the blessings of today. If the pastor in charge finds that the word has convicted him, he should answer the altar call and let some other person lead in the prayer. And at the end of it all, God will see the humble and exalt, but the proud he will resist. Whosoever continues in sin has not seen God, neither known him. Let us pray. so much for this word that you have shared to your people touching the hearts showing the experience that is essential for service without this prerequisite there is no place for enlistment or enrollment into the service of the Lord but you know each and every person those who are in the church there and those who are on their own though that will listen much later after this Easter retreat you know all your word is timeless your word is timeless your word is timeless and your word has comfort will not return unto you void but accomplish the purpose everybody great father that is in need of this word cause the word to reach and cause there to be transformation let there be translation from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. Let the spirit of God purge every heart. Let the spirit of God convict every sinner. Let the spirit of God enable everybody who listen to do what is appropriate, what is right, and get into salvation experience. Father, remember, you have not called the seed of Jacob to seek you in vain. Therefore, all those who have identified with the body of Christ, who have not got this experience, or who have lost it, great Father, having sought you today, having gathered today, having paid attention and listened to your word without distraction, I'm praying that you gender, you generate the experience. You bring the phenomenon to bear. Let there be a transformation. Let the yoke of sin be broken. Let there be newness of life. Let there be graciousness. Let the grace of God that passes all understanding fill such hearts and let them see that they have received power to say no to those external sinful habits. Let every yoke, every ungodly habit, destructive habit, all such things that are offensive to you, let such things be broken right away in the name of Jesus Christ. Let the spirit of truth perfect that that concerns them. Ensure them that the people have their names written in the book of life. Have their names written in the book of life. Have their names written in the book of life. Even this blessed day in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you Lord for answering our prayers. Go ahead and perfect that that concerns your people more messages are coming everyone oh god who, the message accomplishing the purpose of is being given in jesus mighty name 
we have prayed. Amen.